This is exciting. It's, it's, uh, it really is a privilege to be with you uh, here again today and for this occasion. I've been asked to, to share a few words. Uh, uh, it, I think in the, in the program, in the, in the bulletin, it says uh, a charge for Paul, but I would say this is a charge for, for Paul, for Sarah, for you now uh, as a congregation, Faith Church, uh, in your life together. Um, I, I'm, I'm just super excited for you. I'm excited uh, for, uh, for the community and for what God has in store for you in the future. And I'm prayerful and I'm expectant. God is in this and God is in this place and he's in this moment. And it's, it, it, is, it is so, uh, so, so much a blessing. Like having Pastor Sam here um, and, uh, and, and his wife, uh, as you transition into this next uh, season of ministry. Uh, this is a significant crossroads, uh, Paul, for you and Sarah and uh, for Faith Church, and I believe for the community. And, and, it's, and it's an exciting time with opportunities before you to live into the mission of God together. And, and I want to give you just uh, seven simple words, uh, short and sweet, as you begin this next season. The first one is this. Honor, honor the history of Faith Church. Honor the history of this church, the legacy of this church. But don't let it hinder you as you go forward in the future. It's a new day. Honor the history, but be ready for what God has next. Uh, be like the wise farmer. You know, I, I lived in Lancaster County for a number of years. I was a city guy, New York City. Uh, first full, uh, second full-time ministry was in Lancaster, and before that, Shippensburg, but all these farm communities, and, and you learn all sorts of things about farming, and the scriptures uh, came alive for me there with, you know, when, when a farmer is going, when you plant seeds. I had a little garden, an acre garden, and I would try to, uh, the first time out there, I'm like dropping this, like I dug things up, and I'm like dropping the seeds like this, and then I, and then I, you know, I look at the end, it's like, man, it's really crooked. You, 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 you plow forward, right? You move forward. Don't, don't look back. Remember the past, but plot forward into the future. Like Paul says in Philippians 3, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And so press on. Press on in these days ahead together toward the goal, the prize that God has for you in this life together as a community of faith. Press on. God has blessed this church and he's blessed this community because of this church. And you can build on that. Build on it. I believe that you have an opportunity before you for the best days ahead. So press on. Second thing is this. So honor your history, but don't let it hinder you. Second thing is this. Act as if... This is kind of weird maybe to say, but in these days, act as if you're a new church plant with new opportunities before you. Churches across North America are having to do this. There's been a lot that's happened in these last two years in North America. And so at, at my church, at, at our church out in Phoenixville, we've said that it's a new day. And we need to think, remember the past, but think like you're a church plant because it's a new day. Uh, I, Isaiah says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a new way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And, and uh, has it felt like we've been in the wastelands for the last two years? In so many ways. 
God is doing a new work. God wants to do a new thing through you and in you, Paul and Sarah, and through you and in you, Faith Church. Uh, t- take the lessons and the formation from your past and use it to help you plot forward. Faith Church, walk into the vision that God has set before you as a church, but be ready. Be ready for new things. New lessons, new opportunities, new ways of thinking and doing. And the same goes for you, Paul. This is a new day. God wants to do new things. God, God, he's not void from, he, he knows what's happened. He's been with us this last season. And he has purposes. And he has purposes as we go on. Hallelujah. Right? That we can be a part of this. Third thing is this. Relentlessly prioritize the mission of God. In other words, the, the great commandment as your call. Therefore, go. Go and make disciples of all nations and baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to, to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you to the end of the age. Remember that the Great Commission, it starts and it ends with reaching those that, that don't know Jesus yet. It, it starts and it ends with evangelism. Be, in other words, this is what I'm saying. Paul, Faith Church, stay outward focused. Stay outward focused. Don't forget the people in the community that, that need Jesus. Be, be focused on being the salt of the earth in this community. And, and grow, your, grow as a people. Paul, equip the saints here to do what Jesus called us to do, to go, to baptize, to teach, to make disciples. That's the call for us as his people, and it's what he wants us to build into as a church. Go, baptize, teach, be about making disciples in this next season. And the the thing about this is that Jesus calls every one of us, not just Paul, Paul's to be an equipper. He's he's called to shepherd you as a people, to pastor you as a people, to equip you as a people to go and to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. disciples. Be a disciple-making congregation. And the fourth thing is this. Make love your motive. Make love your motive in it all. Make love the thing that drives you in the mission of God together. The great commandment. Uh, You know it. These are not new words, but this is a reminder. Jesus said, he replied to those he asked him, he said, here's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang in these two commandments. Paul, love this people. Love this people that God has given you to shepherd. People, love each other. And love your pastor and and his wife Sarah and, and and their family. Love. Be a family church, Faith. Be a family church. Our world desperately, desperately needs models and places that they can experience healthy community together. And you have an opportunity to give that to them, to give them that gift to get. And the motivation for our living out the Great Commission is the Great Commandment. Love, 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 love. Live out the mission and do it because of love. Because, you know, because he first loved us, it says in First John. That's why. So love God. Love each other with the love of Christ. And love this community to gather with the love of Christ. And the fifth thing is this. Walk prayerfully dependent upon the Father in all of it. I mean, th- there's two commands in the Great Commission, right? The first one is to make disciples. The second one, at the very end, gets missed. It says, and surely, and surely I am with you. It, I mean, Jesus is saying, remember, 
Remember this. Don't forget this. I am with you. I am with you as you go and you live out the Great Commission. I am with you as you live for me in the mission of God. So be prayerfully dependent upon the one that is with you, upon the Father. Live together with a spirit of humility together, a spirit of dependence upon the Father together. He brings unity. Our world needs to see places of unity. When everything's in discord, the Spirit brings unity. In John 17, Jesus prayed that his disciples would be in in unity together. So live in unity, prayerfully dependent upon him for what he has for you. He brings unity, and he brings power as we're unified as a people. So humbly, spirit-led servanthood with unity. And Jesus says, even himself, I can do nothing apart from the Father. We can do nothing apart from him. So be dependent upon him, unified in that. The sixth thing is this, be courageous and tenacious. Be courageous and and tenacious. Uh, Like it says in the scriptures, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord. Why can we be courageous? Because we serve a king. Because we serve the resurrected one. Because we serve the Messiah. Because we have the greatest mission ever given in the history of the world. And because we have the greatest God to be with us. And so be courageous because he is with you, Paul. He is with you, Faith Church, as you go forward in these next days. And the final thing is this. Related, be focused. Stay focused. Keep focused. Be wise. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Stay focused. Be tenacious. I say stay focused because of this. Because we as human beings and and churches collectively, we have this propensity to get caught up in a lot of good things. A lot of good things. There's a lot of good things we can do as a people. Don't get distracted from, from the great thing. Don't get distracted from what God's call is on you as a church. To make disciples and make disciples. And to do it in the spirit of love, dependence upon the Father, love for God and love for others. Those are my words for you. Simple. Build on the past, but don't get hindered from it. Act as if you're a new church plant with new opportunities before you because they're there. Relentlessly prioritize the Great Commission. Do it with the spirit of the Great Commandment. Walk prayerfully dependent upon the Father. Be courageous and tenacious and focused and wise as you live that out. I'm, I, I want to ask, and I'll just say amen, amen, amen. I want to ask uh, Pastor Sam to come up. He's going to be leading us in a time of prayer now for, uh, and, and Pastor Paul and uh, Sarah, if you'll come up and take uh, seats here in these chairs and uh, elders, um, uh, you're to come up and stand behind them as, as uh, Sam leads us in this, this prayer of commissioning now for this new day that God has for us.
Thank you, Pastor Sam and Mike. It is my extreme pleasure and honor to welcome you, Paul, on behalf of Faith Church to the pulpit for your first time as senior pastor. It's been a joy for me to get to know you over these last about five months, and I've sensed and felt your love for people and your passion for Jesus Christ. Your desire to bring these two passions together and help individuals experience the love of Jesus and find fulfillment in a life lived for Him is contagious. We know that God's power and His Holy Spirit will do great things as we all seek to be obedient to His Word. So we are known as a body of believers here at Faith Church to be loving, warm, welcoming, and caring. And so I would ask that once again, and show Paul and his family just how warm we are, please join me in welcoming Pastor Paul Schaefer, Senior Pastor of Faith Church at the podium. I mean, 
it's, it's amazing when you look back and you see that it's not just you doing these things, right? It's a group of people who come around you and help you. And um, I think of I think of even Mike. You know, Mike and I started our conversations many months ago, and it's been cool to build a friendship with Mike and get to know him. We're looking forward to continuing that. Thank you for those challenging six words. And I'm going to remember those, and uh, maybe I can get get that from you after the service. I'd love to. So thank you guys so much. We're here. We're ready to join. Uh, so with that said, last time I was here, we read and we focused on Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 5. So if you have a Bible with you today, or if it's your cell phone, or I use a tablet, your tablet, you can turn open to Matthew chapter 5. So we, we really focused on Jesus' words, and that was intentional, right? It was, it was kind of like, okay, this is my one message. I don't know if this is what God would have for us to come here to faith. We were still all praying about it, you guys, where we were, you know, but what is it? What is it that God would have us focus on? If I were to strike one note and talk about kind of a way forward, God, what would you have for us to look at? And as I considered that, God led me to Matthew chapter 5 and Jesus' statements there. And we talked about this idea of kingdom culture. So I'd like to read, read those words this morning. So Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, I'm reading from the English Standard Version uh, as we read along. So verse 1 uh, is Jesus. He sees the crowds. And he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So in September, we talked about this idea of kingdom culture. So it's not necessarily, you know, a culture that begins with us. You know, like we create this culture, it originates with us. But this is a culture that originates with Christ himself, with God. It's a culture that we put into practice as a group. So, an example, you know, I think of an example of, of a company culture. You know, they talk about company culture. I think of Chick-fil-A. And you guys have Chick-fil-A up here. As I was coming up north, I was wondering, you know, how many Chick-fil-A's I was going to run into. Because down there, they're like Baptist churches. They're on every corner. So, you know, like, I'm wondering, okay, are we going to get some Chick-fil-A? I actually had Chick-fil-A at an in Exton the other day. But I don't know if it's true up here. Down south, after you order or, you know, give your order, they say, um, my pleasure, right? And so I don't know if that's true. up. Is that true up here? Do they do that as well? See, it's just like a company culture, right? And it's this, it's this culture that they create, you know, my place. And, and if you sit in the restaurant, too, I don't know if you've had this happen at Chick-fil-A. And McDonald's, right? Um, you know, people could care less, right? Like, there's a sense in which somebody might come along and, like, put a cigarette out on your table as you're eating. You know, that's McDonald's culture, right? 
Chick-fil-A culture, though, is entirely different. You're sitting, like, at the table, and they actually kind of treat you like a human being, right? Like, they'll come up to you and say, hey, you know, can I refill your drink, or can I get something for you, right? I think that's a company culture. I don't think that's happening by accident. I think they're training their people to behave in such a way that they treat people like people, like they actually care about the customer, right? So there's this culture that's being created, and every church is creating a certain kind of culture. And I think that if we're going to be healthy, and that's what we want, we want to be a healthy, growing church, right? Not just for our glory, but ultimately for God's glory, for his greatness. You know, how do we get there? And I think a lot of churches try to tackle that by creating programs, uh, by creating activities. And I think Jesus's, his strategy is for us to look at who we are on the inside before him. Look inward. Look at our character, who, we, who we're called to be, and to create this culture. You know, what are the things that we're going to value here as a church? What are the things that we're going to be about? What are we going to be known for? And I hope that the things that we're going to be known for is that we have a poverty of spirit. That we don't um, sweep under the rug our spiritual bankruptcy, but we own it. We realize that before God, we're, we're that sinner in the temple that's beating his chest and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You know, that's what we value here. We value, hey, we're broken people and we need God to restore us and to make us whole. And we're going to depend on him. We're a church that values and places a high premium on, on meekness, on thinking about others, on humility. You know, we're, we're a church that hungers and, and thirsts for righteousness. And so what are we about? What kind of culture are we going to make here? And I hope the kind of culture that we're going to build and make together, the kind that I want to help lead us toward is this, is this Matthew chapter 5. And that sounds an awful lot like, oh, we don't have that going on here. And in fact, I see a lot of that already taking place. And so it's just a continuing on of what you guys are already doing. I see so much you guys are thinking about the needs of others. You know, we need to continue on and press on in that work. So as I was preparing, you know, for today, I, I thought, well, God, what would you have me talk about? And so God led me. He just said, how about you continue Jesus's words in Matthew chapter five? How about you go on past verse 12 and, and, and have him take a look at verses 13 and 14 and 15 and 16? So that's what we're going to look at. We're going to start in verse 13 where Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others. So they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So before we uh, just go further, let's pray and ask God to give us understanding and help us to apply what we're reading this morning. Father, these are your words, and we want to sit under your teaching. Father, we want to understand what you have for us. We want to take it in and, and not only understand it, but apply it and be transformed by it. God, teach us and show us this morning um, not, not just how to pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps and, and be better Christians, but Father, by your empowering, by you in us, living in us, the new life you've given to us. Father, by your spirit, how to live as salt and light in our world. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So 
what, you know, what we're looking at today is to live in such a way. We want to live in such a way that your good works, what you say and how you live and how you treat other people, how you relate with those around you, how you relate with the world around you, even yourself, you know, your good works, that they lead others to know and worship God. So in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, we talked about kingdom culture. And in Matthew chapter 5, 13 through 16, we're going to talk about the influence of that kingdom culture. Matt Chandler, he's a pastor at the Village Church in Texas. And so he kind of broke these two sections down this way. He talked about character, and in the verses we just read, he talks about influence. Some people, instead of talking about influence, they talk about witness, which is kind of an old word, old church lingo. That is talking about, you know, how we live before others, what we're, what we're talking to them about. The idea comes from like a courtroom. You have a witness who's testifying to what's happened and the truth that has happened. And so what we're doing is we're using our influence. What we're doing is we're going from inward to outward. And so we're, we're helping people to see how Christ has changed us. We're testifying to his work in our lives, not just by what we say, but actually how we're living. And so Christianity, it works. It should change lives, right? It should make us more like Christ. And so the idea is uh, this idea of influence. We need to focus both on character and our influence. So I want you guys to just check out real quick. Jesus says you here. He says you. And we might just think Jesus is speaking to an individual, but this is plural. Jesus is speaking to you all, everybody who's present, the disciples. So in today, that's, that's all of us here, the church. And he says you are. Notice he says you are, not you might be or someday, you know, you might be this. But he actually says, you are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Now, that's kind of like bold, right? If you would hear somebody say, I am the light of the world, you'd be like, this guy is so egotistical, right? Like, I can't wait for the first pin to come along and pop that balloon. Um, but Jesus, right, he, he says, I am the light of the world in John 8. And then he turns around and says, you are the light of the world. So we're not making these claims for ourselves. Rather, Jesus is saying this about who we are. You are the salt of the earth and the light of the world, he says. So you are the salt of the earth. Now, during this time, like salt was precious. It was very valuable. And one of the things that it was used for was to preserve things like meat, to keep it from rotting. And so you wouldn't want, even today, right, you don't want to eat rotting meat. It's going to make you sick. So there was some way that it had to be preserved. Now, people who sold salt often would mix salt with other kinds of minerals. And so imagine that you go out and buy salt. And you want to preserve the meat, right? You want to keep it from rotting because you want to eat good, healthy meat. And you get home and you pour it into the bowl, right? And you put it onto your meat. And then a couple days later, you find out that your food is rotting. And you're like, why is my food rotting? I put salt on it. And you look at your bowl and you realize that the person who sold you the salt mixed so many other minerals in there that there's hardly any salt in it, right? And that's this idea. And so what would you do? You realize it's useless. So in ancient times, what you do is you pick up the bowl and you toss your salt, this salt, that's really just a bunch of other minerals and stuff out the door. And now people are, tr are trampling on this salt, really all, this, all, all these other minerals, right? And so what Jesus is saying is that it's possible that even though you are the salt of the world, that you get mixed with all these other kinds of minerals. And, it's, and, and so you have to kind of ask yourself, like, well, what are these other kinds of minerals that we would get mixed with? 
You know, what are the other things that are mixing with this salt to, to make it lose its saltiness? And so as we, as we think about that, I, th- I think not only are, do we influence, but we're being influenced by people, by things around us, ideas around us. I think a big current idea today is, you know, I do meet a ton of people who are spiritual, or they say they're very spiritual, but they're also just very material in that the only thing that, that really matters is what you can kind of touch and handle and see and taste, that those are the things that are real. We really don't know what happens after we die, right? And so this is, this is pretty current, and it can seep in to where we can get affected and we can begin to think those ways. I'm sure, myself included, right, that we all have Christian, that as Christians, there's times that you wrestle with doubt, right? Like what, truly what happens after you die? You know, what, what goes on? You know, and you can be influenced by these things to where you begin to live in such a way. You know, if, if all that is is what is here right now, it's very tempting to just say, let me just take care of myself and my family. Right? Where Jesus says, you know, blessed are the meek. The meek, like him, look out for others and their well-being. You know, they don't put themselves ahead of others. They're thinking about the needs of other people, right, and trying to serve them. And so this philosophy can even start to seep into where we say, as Jesus' disciples, well, come on. Like, I got to look out for me. Who's going to look out for me, right? And so we can lose our saltiness, Christ is saying. And salt, like we said, preserves meat from rotting. So you kind of have to ask, like, what's the, what's the meat? What are we preserving from rotting? And Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. And earth is for mankind, humanity, society. So Christians, like, as we live out Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, right? We're the salt of the earth. We keep society from rotting in a way. We preserve what's good about it. So as we like serve other people, people see that and they're like, wow, dude, that's crazy. Like who lives like that? Who gives up their whole Saturday to go help somebody else? Like if I had a Saturday, I'd go down to the beach or something, right? Like who gives that up? Who does that sort of thing? And so we encourage people to set their set their sights higher, right? To aim higher. So in a way, we keep even society from rotting, uh, Christ is saying. He not only says you're the salt of the earth, but the light of the world. So in Jesus' time, right, there's no like Walmarts or city of Philadelphia that casts light pollution. Like if you're out in the country, it is dark, in Jesus' time. Some of you guys probably live out in the country enough to where it's pretty dark and you can see like a billion lights, right? Stars in the sky. Down in Richmond, like we would come up to see Sarah's parents and we'd look up into the sky. And we're like, there's this many stars? Like we read about it in books, but we can kind of see it now, right? In Richmond, we can't see that much. I mean, the light pollution just takes it away. In Jesus' time, you can be out in the countryside. It's so dark. And then you come up on a city that's set on top of a hill, and the lamps are lit, and you see the light from the city glowing. It attracts you. It draws you. But it also, once you get to the city, you're not out in the country. You can see what's around you, right? Light provides illumination. And so in the same way Jesus is making this metaphor, he's saying you're a light. You provide illumination. You help the world. You help other people see what's right and good and true and beautiful. And so Jesus is saying use your influence. Use your influence. Let them see your good works and see past you to God to praise him. You know, praising God is ultimately about knowing God, counting him as what is most good and beautiful and right and lovely. It's counting him as as what we adore, what we love. It's entering into 
a relationship with him. And so what we want other people to do, you know, we not only want to testify or talk about Christ's love for us, but we want to demonstrate Christ's love in us, at work in us. And so people see those good works, and it matches with what we're saying, and it points beyond us. And so I'm sure that you guys hopefully have had relationships where people know that you're a Christian, right? And they see you, like, living out your faith for real, and they're like, I want part of that, right? Like, it attracts them. Like, I, I want to kind of have what you have. I want to, whatever is going on in your life, like, I would, like, talk to me about it, right? And so what happens, though, and what's easy sometimes for us for it to happen as Christians is we can divorce kind of how we live from what we say. So we can say the right things, but our lives remain unchanged. And people see that and they're like, oh, okay. So like Christianity is just about like saying the right things or believing the right things, but it actually doesn't produce any kind of change in your life. And so we need these two things to match, right? And by God's grace, we need to ask him, God, like on my own, I'm, I'm going to get to, I can't remember what like running back did it, but some running back like got to like the one yard line and just like spiked the ball. I can't remember when this happened, but probably somebody in the, in the sport, you know, a ton of sports knows about this. And it's like, we can do that spiritually, right? Like, God, I'm going to do that, right? That's that spiritual bankruptcy. Like, to live out the Christian faith for real, I need your help. I need you at work in me because I'm frail, I'm weak. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Help me. And so you might think, like, I can't be salt. I can't be light, right? And that might be because you're thinking about how horrible you are. You know, like, you just don't know how awful I am. Or you might be thinking, like, again, like, I just, I know I can't do it on my own. And I think that's exactly where you ought to be. Like, if you hear Jesus' words here, and you're like, I got it, that's a bad place to be. But if you hear Jesus' words, and you're like, Man, I can only do that if Christ is at work in me, like changing me every day. You know, I can only do it by his grace. That's an awesome place to be and to recognize that we are only lights and salts because Jesus is the light of the world. He is the salt of the earth. It's kind of like, how do we get to be lights? You know, I think about a candle, right? You need a match, and you light the match, and you light the candle. Jesus is the match, right? Like, he's the original light that that lights us, that makes us light. So we can't ever say, hey, I don't need that anymore. We need Christ to light us every day, right, if we're going to be lights of the world. So the encouragement that I wanna that I wanna give to you in the same encouragement that Jesus gave to his disciples here is so let your light shine before men that they might see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. That's the vision I want to cast for us, right? We have, I think, a tendency in this passage is Jesus talks about two things. He he talks about Christians who are so influenced by the world that they no longer influence others for Christ. So Jesus is saying, be on guard from adapting too much to culture. And it would be so easy to be like, okay, so Jesus is saying, like, cut myself off from culture, go over here and, like, create my own, like, little Christian community and do my own thing apart from culture. But Christ also says, you have to be a light, that they might see your good work. So you have to be involved in culture. You can't, so there's this tension, right? You have to be in the world and, and not be so influenced and adapting to it, but you have to be in it, shining light, loving culture, right? So I want us to just have this vision, hopefully, like the culture that we're making here is the one that Jesus gives in Matthew chapter five. You know, this poverty of spirit, this meekness, this thirsting and hungering for righteousness. And 
that we are allowing that kind of culture to influence not only one another here, but even in this community, this region, the state, the city of Philadelphia. Uh, I have tremendous faith and, and belief that Christ can do amazing things through us. And it's not just based on us, but Christ at work in us. So I'm hoping that you guys will join me. I'll join you, like, together. I've met some incredible people here who, are, who love Christ and praying, dependent on him. I, I hope that you will, with me, continue to pray, to depend, trust in God. You know, I, as, as, you know, the pastor... It's, it, Christ is the pastor. I'm trusting in him. I, I, you know, just in preparing for this message, preparing for this short challenge, it was like, God, I, I, can't, I can't do this, right? But you can do this. And so I'm trusting. I feel a lot like Moses, right? Like Moses was like, you know, God, I... You know, he, he talked all about his frailty to the point where God was like, dude, relax. Like, you need to realize that I, I, like, I love you. I'm with you. And so I need to realize that. And together for us to, to be that dependent on God, to say, God, like, I, I want to follow Christ. I want to live out Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. And I want to be an influence. Would you help me? Would you help us get there? Would you help us love? Help us to love you with all of our heart, mind, and soul. Help us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Help us to be, you know, real and genuine. So I hope that uh, you guys will join me in on the journey. It's not just me, like it's us working together. We're a team. I think Pastor Sam said it. Like we're a team. He, he, he mentioned, you know, the founding families and how they work together. Mike mentioned just, hey, think about it as a church plant. They were a church plant, right? So like we're a team. Like where do we go from here? Let's build. Let's grow together. So thank you guys so much for the opportunity to be here. Thank you for calling me to come on as pastor. I want you to know that, like, I, I sincerely want to get to know you guys. I hope that we form some great friendships. So in the coming days and weeks, feel free to reach out to me, you know, if you need anything, like, you know, reach out to me. Um, and then... I'll be reaching out to you guys to try to set up some times for us to be able to, to really get to know one another. Um, I'm interested in, yeah, truly getting to know you and, and being there for you and uh, praying with you um, and just in any way that I can be of help. Um, please let me know. Thank you guys so much. Let's pray. And then I will leave. Stan, you coming up after this? Yeah. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for time with faith, family, and, and time to look at your word, time to consider what it means to be salt and light. Father, I pray that we would be people who have a heart for you and a love for you and that we would use that influence to truly um, better people, um, that they might to look out for their good, that they might know you and worship you and have fellowship with you. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the worship team who's coming out to lead us now. God, I pray that you would draw us into worship of you. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen.